On this journey, we venture to the remote Bella Coola Valley, deep in the Great Bear Rainforest of British Columbia's epic coastal mountains. In order to visit the traditional territory of the Newhawk Nation, where stories of hairy man-like creatures known as the Sninik have persisted for centuries. The Bella Coola Valley is nestled among the endless coastal mountain ranges of British Columbia. It is a part of the 15.8 million acre Great Bear Rainforest, which comprises 25% of the world's remaining coastal temperate rainforests. Stretching across much of the BC coastline up to the Alaskan border, this remote and stunning area is the homeland of the Newhawk Nation, who have a very deep-rooted connection to this land, residing in it for tens of thousands of years. The Newhawk have a very rich culture in general, filled with incredible artwork, woodcraft, and much more. Like other First Nations along the rain coast of what is now Canada and the United States, the Newhawk have stories of strange upright creatures said to resemble both man and hairy beast. But without attempting to speak on their behalf about their folklore and beliefs, I will leave that to those who can accurately and appropriately describe it. I will instead focus on my journey to this beautiful corner of the world and what I learned along the way from the Newhawk nation and from the land itself. I first learned of Bella Coola from the writings of well-known outdoorsman and hunting guide Clayton Mack of the New Hulk Nation, who in his book Grizzlies and White Guys described various encounters with Sasquatch-like creatures in remote areas around Bella Coola. Mixed in with stories of his exploits and adventures as a grizzly bear hunting guide in the region, his straightforward writing style and matter-of-fact reporting on various incidents made these encounters seem earnest and believable. While Clayton claimed a few sightings of Sasquatch himself in the book, he also described stories from his family and others in the area. This following passage is his writing about what he thought these things might have been and how they behaved. Quote, Sometimes I wonder what kind of animal is a Sasquatch. Half man, half animal, I think. You know all the Indians up and down coast have the same name for Sasquatch, Bukwas or Box. Many different languages, but same name for Sasquatch. I think they live in caves in winter, hibernate like a bear. I don't think they like fish. Sasquatch got strong smell, smell like a pig they say. I never smell it, never did in my life. But a lot of guys smell them. They see them and smell them. I saw the one in South Bentink up close, but I never smell nothing on him. Maybe wind blowing the other way. The way a Sasquatch finds out how far apart each other's is, is they pick up a stick and hit a tree with that stick. Makes a spooky noise. You will hear bong on one side of the valley, then bong when another one answer from the other side of the valley. End quote. 
While this passage is from at least 1993, when the book was published, what I find intriguing about it is the mention of smell being present for some of the encounters, as well as the form of communication being wood knocking of some sort, which has been widely reported in various parts of North America in conjunction with possible Sasquatch encounters. It is interesting to hear this coming from a source that lived very much close to the land and spent so much time in the bush. But I digress. Inspired by the stories from Clayton's book, I strive to visit Bella Coola for myself. The journey to Bella Coola is a long one. From Vancouver, it is around 12 hours by car through much of the interior of British Columbia. Joined by an old friend of mine named Mikkel, we began the long trek to reach Bella Coola. We just made it down the infamous so-called hill heading into Bella Coola. Absolutely just amazing getting down here. You see the river roaring down there. We would spend the next few days exploring Bella Coola and its surrounding areas. In English, my government name is Jarrell Nelson. I was born on the traditional Nuhalk territory of Kumkuts and Kwatna, which in English you would call uh, Bella Coola or the, the town site and Kwatna. And so that is where my family comes from, that is where I come from, but today I reside in Upper Four Mile or Sinch, which is a sunny town. And yeah, I live here. It's like a rainforest meets the Rockies, which I guess is what it is. It's, you get a little bit of everything. You get some swamp, you get river, you get nice mountain ranges. You don't get really any prairies in this neck of the woods, but there's lots of big, big trees. There's lots of beautiful rivers, small creeks, and uh, hidden valleys of paradise. We connected with Jarrell in order to hear about some traditional New Hulk stories and their importance culturally, including those about what is referred to as the Sninik, which I found particularly fascinating. So a Sninik is anywhere in between 8 to 12 feet, is what they would say normally, like a, like a good-sized tree. And they're human in 
they're humanoid in figure as in like they they walk upright they have two arms they have two legs they have shoulders they have a belly but uh the way that i heard that they walk is kind of like how a gorilla would walk kind of like hunched forward a bit and like so they don't really walk straight straight up but a little bit more hunched and a little bit so they could be even taller but again i think nine to twelve feet it's like uh they're just big humans and then instead of like hair because some of the animals that we talk about have hair like long hair like this like all over their body they have fur like a dog like and so yeah that's how i would describe them oh and uh their main feature of a sninic compared to a sasquatch is a sasquatch is just a big human whereas a sninic has the ability to paralyze because they have these little crystals hidden behind their eyes and in those crystals when they flip their eyes they shine out a light like a flashlight and it paralyzes you it uh, renders you immobile yeah, oh and they have a basket on the back that they steal children with or men who knows and so they they take the kids and, and you kind of described it earlier you can get in but you can't really get out yeah it's it's with all these like uh, needles and they point downwards so it's very easy to slip in like a crab trap but you can't come back out yeah it's very embedded within our culture and because so sninics aren't like boogeymen even though they're kind of that's the word that you would kind of use in english nowadays that like uh you know like what do the uh better stop crying or the boogeyman's gonna get you or whatever right like that's what they say in like Europe and stuff like that or like what's the Baba Yaga yeah. you know what I'm, yeah like it's very much the same thing whereas like if you cry at night then you're gonna have a snake come get you and so it was very much used as like a like a cautionary tale or like a you know one of these days Alice I'm gonna send you right to the moon like when you keep crying so much the snake's gonna come steal you but they come from a much deeper part of our culture than that. It's um, everything before was dark. And finally, Ashkwindam, he created this whole world with the help of his uh, brothers and sisters. And they were gifted a light, which was supposed to uh, bright up the whole universe. But he was selfish and he thought, oh, I was given this cool, important job. So I'm going to grab this awesome gift and I'm going to hide it away. I'm going to smother it and no one's ever going to see it. It's all going to be mine. And his... Uh, underlings like the people that he was in charge of creator they thought like that's no good but we can't do anything or we'll be insubordinate you know we'll be like banished or whatever so the oldest brother of these four reached his hand into the fire and he pulled out a bird and the four of these brothers together created raven who became like our loki or became our trickster he became the one who re and the way that my elders taught me was uh, he's an editor he's not a creator he's not a fixer he he's an editor he takes something and he changes it to the way that it should be and so in that time of chaos when he brought light to our world and that's i hate the word stolen because it was never supposed to be kept in the first place he freed the light so if you ever hear that raven freed the light <laughs> it never stole um gives us a bad reputation and so uh yeah raven when he freed the light it created the need for a lot of things because there was never a difference in day. It was always just one continuous period. And so now you had the sun that needed a place to go. And they, the four carpenters who are talking about that created Raven, they created a sunbeam for the, or a, like a bridge for the sun to travel upon. And within that, all these creatures, because like I said, everything was dark and everything was chaos. And so when this was all made, these creatures and these chaos kind of came out and so they were also the creatures that inhabited so our people i'm getting way ahead but our people believed that all of this all these mountains were once giants and so they were once frozen and uh and turned into stone and so amongst that like if you have a hundred giants you're not going to notice Ninic. you know what i mean because they're so much smaller and i so i think that they lived here before but with the giants being gone, they now had more free reign of the world and nothing threatening them. And so that's when they would have cultivated their own society or their own. And that's how we think of them. Like a lot of the stories, they do have like high ranking people or they have sons and daughters or they're, they're their own people. They're their own race. They're their own thing. They're not monsters. They're not faceless boogeymen who just steal children and eat them. Now, in terms of Obviously, there's this kind of modern craze where it's Sasquatch, Bigfoot around the world, Yeti, you know, you name it. 
do you think that the story of the Sninik kind of fits into that or is its own unique sort of uh, entity being? or yeah. um, I definitely so I I've always thought of it this way of like you look at me and then you grab some dude from Taiwan we're not going to look anything alike. We're not even going to be able to communicate with each other, right? And if you showed that to an alien, you'd be like, yeah, those are two different things. Those are, you know, and if you show, like, Shaquille O'Neal and, like, Avril Lavigne, I would think those are two totally different species, right? <laughs> so that's just how I view things, is that they're all the same. They're just different races. They're not different um, creatures. They're just, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, in terms of, um, you know, kind of modern counters there seems to be a lot in town and i know you talked a little bit before about something you've had happen in kind of a, in an ancestral land and some kind of an interesting incident anything you'd like to talk about with that no next question i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> Whatever uh, works. no yeah uh, so i'll just start with a little bit of context uh, my family is quite outdoorsy uh, my dad the man who raised me was a part of a land back activism kind of thing back in the 90s uh, in the protection of Ista or um, our traditional land and then so once that was kind of done and settled away with my dad was like well they're not going to stop the the forestry and the logging and they're they're just they're so greedy that they're not going to stop so I can't speak for everybody but I can speak for myself and I want my land to be protected I want my children to be able to go into the woods and say yes this is my land this is where my dad lived this is where my grandpa lived this is where you know to time memorial this is where my people have been, so this is where I too shall die. And so he went to the uh, traditional land called Suhuilk, uh, and that is the Mac territory. Other families come from there, so don't, I'm not, but the Mac is, comes from there, and other families as well. But so he started building a cabin there, because that way if a logging company ever rolled up, there's a cabin, they can't do anything, people live here. You know, go back to Ontario or wherever. And so, um, yeah, he built this cabin. And we took my uncle, who is a, you know, a little bit of an alcoholic, and uh, my parents were telling him, like, and again, this is just from what I remember, could have been totally different, he could have been sober, so I'm sorry if you're seeing this uncle and you were sober, but uh, he went and uh, he just took off, he took one of our canoes, because we had a bunch of canoes tied to a tree, it was high tide, he went and took one of his canoes, and we thought because, like, where we parked our boat, so you park your boat and then you take your canoes up the river, or your little speedboat or whatever, but uh, canoes are just easier and less fuel and whatever. So we, he took a canoe and um, because the boat was so far out that we thought there's no way he would go to the boat. It's like a three hour paddle. Like there's no way he would ever go that way, right? So we figured that he went upriver. And so the four of us, me, my dad, my other uncle and myself all take off looking in the boat. And the only way I could describe it is because like with a scream, there's a very obvious start and there's a very obvious end and you can tell it's being controlled by breath because it's like a, ah, you know, like, or if anyone else is screaming, it's like a very human or very, uh, like, you can tell what it's coming from. It's got a organic way of, yeah. And so when I heard this, it was like, like a movie, like just the most in, inhuman, guttural, like, it sounded like if a bear could speak English or, you know, it was just something to this day that I'll never really forget. And it was just like, it sounded like a siren. It sounded like it was coming from something mechanical or something huge. And yeah, we just all got freaked out and we went back to the campsite and my uncle was sitting there eating a bag of Doritos. Where the hell were you? And he's like, I'm hungry. All right, go pass out. Like, and so that's just one of the stories. And my family has more stories of that nature as well like just little encounters. My mom actually one time, this one just kind of popped in my head. Her and her friend were going to dump fish guts and they were joking with each other. Oh, it's real late at night. I'm probably gonna run into a sninik. And they, oh, ha ha, whatever. And they went to go dump these fish guts because, uh, so usually you go dump it, like you can dump it at the wharf or fat, you, fast moving water is the best though, right? Is that's, you want it to be washed away. And so they went to this one little creek and as they were like, doing whatever they seen a flashlight and they thought oh someone else dumping their fish too so they hi how are you doing yeah good to see you nothing and all of a sudden that flashlight goes from like down here to like 12 to 15 feet in the air and so they immediately like okay that's not human and they just walked away and that's the story that my mom has that's pretty cool. 
Do you know um, of people, I mean, I'm assuming growing up, you probably heard just stories galore in the area of, of people having weird things happen or seeing strange things. I mean, how was that like kind of uh, growing up in the area? Well, a lot of it molded who I am as a person. Just So, like, I'm very cultural, even though it doesn't look like it, you know. I, I don't got no braids in my hair or nothing, but uh, I live, breathe, and speak the culture. At least I try to. And so, like, um, I've, I've always thought of it kind of like, kind of like, yeah, like a grizzly bear encounter. Um, if you walk around with fish perfume, you're going to get tacked, you know, if you, or if you just like leave garbage all over your place, obviously the bears are going to come into your, your yard. So there's things of like, um, you don't talk bad about them. You don't really, and the other thing that I was told is that if you say their name a lot, that means that they're around because they're like you're thinking of them and you're like speaking them into existence and so that is something that I've always kind of been like cautious of is to not take their name in vain I guess is how you would say. Prior to the actual trip out to Bella Coola, I was in touch with various locals who either had stories to tell or places they recommended to visit. One such person I spoke with was Sheldon, who ran a show on the local New Hulk radio station and invited us on to discuss our visit to the region. Coming back with Alex Petikoff on the dial for our daily interview. Yetis Inoch, 7. 30 here on the Wake Up Morning Show. I'm New How Howda, joined with a couple special guests here. They've uh, made a long journey to be a part of the New Hulk territory, and I'm very excited about this. But uh, first, let's welcome Alexander. I know we've been in contact for maybe over a month or so, and I really want to welcome you to New Hulk traditional territory that is known as New Hulk so welcome, Alexander. Thank you so much. I mean, it's uh, such an amazing area. Uh, this is just one of the most beautiful places I've driven into. So it's a, a blessing to be here. You know, what are your biggest hopes here, Alexander, in regards to coming all the way here on this amazing journey and adventure? So as, as whenever I go on these kind of trips, I love meeting the people along the way. That I think is the biggest highlight. Uh, places that otherwise, if I didn't have this shared passion of Sasquatch with, I don't know if I'd ever come to a place like this. I mean, it's one of those things to meet the people and uh, obviously your culture has been here for such a long time and being able to just come as a visitor and, and learn as much as I can about the area. And just the stories, I, I'm a storyteller at heart, so being able to share some of these tales I think is a, is a very important one for me and being able to do it accurately and without embellishment or taking that story and unfortunately in the media nowadays especially with larger production companies there is a tendency to exaggerate stories and 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 bend the truth whereas as an independent creator i can just tell the story as it is i don't need to add any kind of excitement that doesn't need to be there i think the the reality is is true enough and interesting enough and um, I don't think I've ever really seen m much coverage out of this area, so uh, it would be an absolute honor to to share some of those stories. And I wish you the best in those beautiful endeavors, and, 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 and may those dreams come true. I want to welcome friend, uh, working, I'm, I'm sure you have a wonderful working relationship with Mikal. Mikal? Yes. yes. Well, welcome and good morning, and it's tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, I'm, I'm Mikhail Izgani and I'm from Mexico City and we this is actually the first time we're working together <laughs> we're we're a very we're we've been friends for like 15 years I actually I spent some years in the US in school and that's where where I got my love for nature and exploring and that's when I met Alex and uh, we, we share that that passion for for exploring and so I really haven't had any experiences with with Sasquatch or, or really got into any any of that uh, but I but I, I knew Alex was coming out here and I I had a place in Squamish so I was like oh I want I want to come with you and get to know the people get to know the place uh, I was I'm just really excited about that and getting to know some of the stories 
Beautiful. Well, welcome to Mihawk Territory. And, Thank you and, very uh, much. You know, I, I, I sincerely, uh, you know, hope it's, the, you know, the best time in your lives and a memory that will be everlasting. It was a wonderful discussion with Sheldon about the region and some of the New Hulk stories as well. Again, I, and I hope that week goes well for you. And I know the journey has just begun with us here. And it's an everlasting building relationship that I know you'll I know you'll be back after, <clears throat> you know, this morning, actually hearing some stories and building that foundation for the relationships and the understanding of our SNINIC or AKA the supernatural beings. And, and, and I pray for that clear path for you have a safe journey in life and, and may all those discoveries come true for you. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I really uh, thank you. I want to thank you both for being a part of the Wake Up Morning Show. Yeah, thank you so much for having us, Sheldon. Yeah, thank you very much for welcoming us to the community. It's amazing. You're welcome. That does it for us on the ball. Heat on New Ho Hoda with Alexander Petikoff and Mikhail. Uh, thank you both for being a part of the morning. And I hope you guys will have a wonderful morning, a wonderful day. And as always, shine on and let it shine through, everybody. So we were just on the New Hulk radio. It's really awesome to talk to Sheldon, the host, and we got to meet a lot of people afterwards. People sharing their stories about getting stuff thrown at them, others seeing things. Uh, really, really cool to just kind of hear about all that sort of stuff. And we're actually now right here on the bay, beautiful ocean area. So what a warm and wonderful introduction to this incredible piece of uh, the world here in the Bella Coola Valley. I mean, it just, you look out into these areas and there could be anything, really all sorts of things out there. So just super, super happy to be in the area and super thankful to Sheldon and all the people we got to meet this morning who have really made us feel pretty welcome here in town. So that's really awesome. I love, love coming to places like this and sharing some of the passion. Well, as I sit here on the outskirts of Bella Coola, got the ocean right behind me. Just a beautiful, beautiful day in a beautiful place. Uh, just wanted to talk about that book by Clayton Mack, Grizzlies and White Guys, that uh, is one of the inspirations for me even wanting to come out all the way here to Bella Coola uh, in his talks about Sasquatch. And I wanted to read a little bit from some of the stories in the book about Sasquatch while out here. How fitting of a location, probably some of the areas and the bays that uh, he hunted in. All right, this is uh, from his chapter titled The Sasquatch. I was fishing in Quatna all by myself in August, nobody with me, and I came home for the weekend. I was getting pretty lonely, low on gas, and getting low on grub too, so I went home for a few days. Then I got a fresh start of grub to go back again. I told my wife I'm going back to Kwatna again. Early in the morning on Sunday, I took off from Bella Coola. I was probably in my 30s. I had a little boat, about a 30-foot boat with a single cylinder engine. I got to Jacobson Bay, about 15 miles from Bella Coola, when I saw something out on low tide. I saw something on the edge of the water. It was kneeling down, and I could see his back humping on the beach. It looked like he was lifting up rocks or maybe digging up clams. But there were no clams there. I turned the boat right in toward him. I wanted to find out what it was. For a while there, I thought it could be a grizzly bear, kind of light color fur on the back of his neck, like a light brown, almost buckskin color fur. I nosed right in toward him almost 75 yards to get a good look. He stood up on his hind feet, straight up like a man, and I looked at it. He was looking at me. Gee, it don't look like a bear, it has arms like a human being, it has legs like a human being, and it got a head like us. I keep on going in toward him. 
He started to walk away from me, walking like a man on two legs. He was about eight feet high. He got to some drift logs, stopped and looked back at me, looked over his shoulder to see me. Grizzly bear don't do that. I never seen a grizzly run on its hind legs like that, and I never seen a grizzly bear look over its shoulder like that. I was right close to the beach now. He stepped up on those drift logs and walked into the timber, stepped on them logs like a man does. The area has been logged before, so the alder trees were short, about eight to ten feet high. I could see the tops moving as he was spreading them apart to go through. I watched as he went a little bit higher up the hill. The wind blew me in toward the beach, so I backed up the boat and kept on going to Quatna Bay. One evening, a year later, I was talking to George Olson, who was the manager of the Talio Cannery. I told him about what I had seen, a man-like animal with hair all over his body. George told me he'd seen the same animal the same month and the same year as I had, but only on the other side of the bay. George and his crew watched from their boat as a man-like creature run across the river. So the stories go on. Uh, very interesting. He's got quite a few encounters in there, but there's a sketch in the book that I'll show here. This is uh, what description is, I suppose, artistic rendition of what he saw. There's a few other sightings in there, cataloged, just talking about other experiences. There's one, he was with a guy from California and they saw one of these creatures while hunting. And uh, the guy from California said, oh, you know, we got those two, we call them Bigfoot, something along those lines. It's a very fascinating chapter. It's just a small footnote in this incredible book. And from all the people I've talked to, a lot of the people in town are, are somehow related to Clayton Mack, or he was a distant relative, or something along those lines. I even met a guy from other part of BC who told me he got to hear Clayton Mack speak as a, when he was younger, tell his stories. And he said he was an incredible storyteller. That's what I've heard from a lot of people. And the way the book reads, that definitely is the case. He has a second book. I haven't checked it out, but I would recommend checking this out if you're really interested in this area. I mean, it's, it's pretty magical. The stories of Clayton Mack clearly have resonated with people like myself and countless others who come from far away from this place. But his local impact is also notable. So Clayton Mack is uh, my family, so my stepfather, but the man that raised me is his great-great-grandchild. And so I was actually blessed enough to know Lucy, one of his kids, uh, before she passed. And so I, and also that was one of the first books that I ever did a, like a book study on was because they were doing a bunch of all this like, uh, you know, like Hitler and like all these other stuff. And I thought, well, that's kind of stupid because I've never been to Germany. I don't, you know, I, no hate or anything, but I don't really care about that conflict, right? I would much rather learn about why I don't speak my language, why I have to live the way that I live. And so I started doing more research on my elders and my first people. Later on, we met up with Sheldon and some of his friends, who shared with us some of their stories, as well as an interesting book done by a man named Ivan, who was originally from Croatia and lived in Bela Kula at one point. Ivan was apparently here in search of Sasquatch-like creatures and wrote this book, filled with illustrations, witness sketches, photos, and more. He earned himself the nickname Sasquatch Man. Now this was an interesting parallel for me. Ivan being from Croatia, coming so far in search of this mystery, and myself, with my own familial origins in Croatia and Serbia, also venturing a long way from home to Bela Kula. Quite the coincidence.
recording. Just the ice recording. Just. What did you just huh? What did you just hear? I don't know. It's maybe branches or maybe just water. I mean, what did you hear? Just like branches crackling, something like that. I heard some like sounded loud. I haven't heard anything that's very loud. Oh, that. You hear it? Look at that. It's like a big branch in the water. I think that might be it. First thing I thought was maybe a truck going over the bridge. It was like a. Oh, that could be it too. Just got to our campsite and we're already hearing stuff moving around. I heard weird loud stick noises. A little bit disconcerting being in grizzly bear, black bear, and mountain lion country. Well, just chilling here on the edge of the riverbank. We've been hearing this tapping noise up the river, across the river rather. I um, think maybe it's a branch in the water that's maybe making that noise. It's hard to say, but you know, when you're out in an area like this, it's so remote, so far from town, that uh, obviously your mind plays tricks on you. That happens every time in the field, but it's kind of intriguing. Just you come out here, you really think the possibilities are there, so. Is it thermal? For what? Make sure there's nothing around. <laughs> yeah. Let me check. It's pretty relaxing. Yeah, well, we're gonna call it a night here. Get in the tent, see if anything is going on, we've got audio out. Always amazing to wake up to a site like this. We camped quite close to the river here. Great little area. This was a spot that uh, some of the locals had told us to come check out. That a lot of stuff has happened out here. A lot of sightings, a lot of activity. A lot of them are actually kind of from what it seemed like in conversation, a little bit freaked out to camp out over here. Um, so we came out here, we didn't really hear anything unusual last night. Had the audio out. We may come back to this area again, check out another spot, I don't know. But uh, it definitely seems like it's pretty promising. Final product, fries, bacon, toast, eggs, whatever that is. That morning, while heading back towards town, we received some interesting information once we got cell service. So, just found out that uh, apparently there's been a recent sighting and some kind of a possible footprint find in, in the Bella Coola Valley. Pretty exciting. I'm gonna reserve my judgment until we can possibly check out the area. Just in case there's, you know, a situation of, oh, it's, it's known that we're in the area looking for Sasquatch and maybe somebody you know, is trying to play a prank or something. I'm not insinuating that's what's happening, but you never know. So I was told by somebody um, that just the other night, I'll read straight from the message, just the other night around 10 p.m. there was a sighting and a track up by the Salumt gun range. A loud banging on tin and then loud whistling when they got approached. So um, 
Apparently there was a park ranger that was contacted about it for I believe the provincial park that's here. We're going to hope to get in contact with him as well and see if he was going to look into it or not. But uh, we're going to drive up there now just to check it out and see maybe if there's anything to be seen there. Uh, I really don't know what we're expecting, but uh, I guess we'll see. don't have any plaster, unfortunately, but I have my 3D scanning app, so I could try that. If there's anything interesting, we can get some plaster perhaps from the store. But yeah, so let's, I guess we'll see what happens. And this is a pretty large pile of scat. You can see just a loose mess. You can see hair in there. So, so this this may be grizzly. This may be grizzly. That's likely. It's huge. I mean, the other areas we've been seeing, there's a lot more black bears. So it's possible that this could be an area where a grizzly's been. I mean, that is that, that's gigantic for a black bear. Good look. Something came down this trail. Okay, so here's the situation. Notice these kind of muddy looking impressions on the ground. And I thought, hey, something in here. So I walked over here. We noticed this here. And then some kind of an impression here. And they go up the hill. Oh, dude, yeah, something came up here. Oh, look at that. Dude. I mean, it looks kind of like a boot print. I don't know. Does that look like a... Yeah, that one looks That's a boot like print, okay. But look, so that means somebody went up Is here. Is that yours? No, I didn't walk here. But look at this, that's a good slide. Yeah. And somebody went up the hill up here. They slid here, too. Excuse me, man. Another foot impression right there. Yeah, those are boot prints. Yeah, it looks human. It's like they hiked all the way up here. So we just went all the way up the hill here. Some human prints over here. Just goes to show, even out in the middle of seemingly nowhere. I mean, they're, just to give you a feel for the area. Just a totally random shoot off a logging road. You've got human prints going up that way. So, somebody went up there for some reason. Kinda can't see here. We got some bear here. Deer and gray. Older bear prints. Some clearer deer prints. The bear is kinda right here. It's, not, it's probably a black bear, pretty small. Can you go ahead? Found it. Okay, we found the area of the shooting range. We've seen the signs up in the trees. I guess now the question is looking around and uh, seeing where these tracks might be, if they're here. Made it to the area around the gun range. We've been searching and it doesn't seem to be much. I mean, it's kind of hard to imagine finding something, but uh, according to them, there was some banging on tin. There's a tin roof here. So, I mean, it's really hard to tell much. We have such little information to go off of, unfortunately. While we did not find any tracks or anything else of interest, we decided it might be good to stay the night in this general area and found a campsite.
we've decided to camp at this place right by the riverside. Obviously it's kind of hard to hear anything with the river being here, but maybe that'll encourage something to come and check us out. This is not far from the location of the alleged sighting, just from the track find, so we're hoping maybe tonight something interesting can happen, but it's a pretty cool spot just right by the river here. A little fire pit. Beautiful mountain view. A lot of big, really spooky looking trees all around us here. Walking around outside a little bit. Just listening, I've got uh, some headphones in, amplify sound. Very creepy out here, very loud from the river, but we keep hearing what sounds like a thumping noise. Could just be water from the river. I'm be ready for sleep here. I'm gonna deploy the AGM thermal camera, powered on a external power bank. Just have that running through the truck, coming across the river. It should be charging, I'm gonna disguise it a little bit. My overnight thermal camera managed to capture some wildlife. This first clip shows a hummingbird passing by, very close to the lens itself. The second clip showcases what I believe is possibly a bear, as it moves through the trees across the river from us. You can see the animal moving better in a sped up version of the same clip. Given the distance to the trees across the river from us, and how low to the ground the animal looked, a bear seemed logical as it does appear to be bulkier than a deer, even if it is hard to tell overall. We headed back towards town in order to visit a very special place, but along the way we were stopped while in front of a store by some locals who wanted to share their stories with us. We were just told by some folks here, uh, they were driving by and they saw us in front of a store out here and they, they were telling us all these kinds of stories that they've had. The guy was a mushroom picker and said up towards the top of the valley he had an encounter and they could hear it making this noise that sounded like the predator noise like this clicking weird kind of sound and I just talked about hearing all the stories growing up and all the other encounters in the area and basically they said down that end of the valley so away from town is where most of the interesting stuff has happened or stories have been told. So 
So right now we're hanging out. We're gonna be taken actually to a New Hulk petroglyph site. These are some sacred petroglyphs to their culture. We're gonna be taken by uh, Clyde who is very culturally aware and um, you know, kind of an expert in, in, in his culture really. So it's gonna be really interesting to see from what I understand or what I've been told rather, there are some connections to this unique kind of Sasquatch-like entity in connection with the carvings as well as in connection with just their culture in this area. So I'm gonna wait for them to tell me about that instead of assuming that. I mean, I have been told that by other interviews, but I will let Clyde do the speaking on that part. So this is just me kind of uh, stating a few things about what we're about to do before the fact. So, we just got done taking a almost two hour tour of these petroglyph sites and my mind is spinning right now. Um, we didn't film or take any pictures of it or anything uh, out of respect and of course that is kind of part of the rules so we wanted to make sure of course to follow that but we were shown around by Clyde who is just such a, such a wealth of knowledge about the cultures and the, the tradition here. It's absolutely unbelievable. I mean just my takeaways are uh, at least from what I understood, over 12,000 years old, uh, possibly older. I can't remember, there was just so much information that, that we were gifted essentially by this man, which was incredible. Uh, but the, the themes that were a part of the culture of the New Hulk people and the traditions and uh, the Sninik being a central sort of part of that in some aspects with the cosmic Sninik and there was a depiction of that and there were a few different Sninik depictions which I found really, really interesting. So showing how, how integrally tied that story is to the folklore here. Again, just closing up my thoughts on this petroglyph site. Absolutely incredible. I know both uh, my friend and I were blown away. He, I asked him if he wanted to join the recap with me and he basically said his mind is, is kind of is spinning because of all the information and you know, all the history and everything and the injustice that we heard about as well that the New Hulk people dealt with smallpox and sort of the eradication that happened which is extremely tragic but it's part of the history and it's important to know that sort of thing so uh, yeah in closing what an experience uh, I wish I could share some of that with with folks um, I, I hope to it someday to, to share some of this with people but of course only with the blessing of the the people here who this belongs to uh, yeah it's been really an absolutely incredible incredible visit to this site and just visit to this area after seeing the incredible petroglyph site we felt inspired and wanted to get out to venture into some valleys south of Bella Coola accessible only by logging roads on our way out we heard some more local stories in the process as well so I was just told about another two encounters that happened in the McCall Flats area. One of a guy, again, mushroom picking with his brother and they were kind of doing their thing, split up, and he heard what he thought was somebody whistling at him. Assuming it was his brother or somebody else did a call, didn't get anything response. Finds his brother sleeping later and says, hey, did you do anything? He says, no. Apparently something was whistling at him. And then another guy we were talking to as well told us his encounter of hunting up in that area in McCall Flats to the right, kind of where we camped one of these nights, saying that uh, they were hunting out there and kind of camping for two nights. First night, nothing happened. The second night, they heard from maybe only a couple hundred feet away what sounded like something kind of screaming at them and they instinctively felt it wasn't really human or animal something kind of in between and they both got kind of freaked out and decided to leave after that so those are two fresh reports we just heard pretty interesting um, again it just seems like so many of the people have stories to tell here in town of just weird experiences around town that in my view you know some of the stuff I've been told about Sasquatch behavior and heard myself kind of seems to fit that that uh, purported behavior kind of profile so that's just some more interesting details.
Well, we've made it up to the snow line here. Don't know how much further we can really make it up here. Probably not much further. Not in the vehicle at least. Prior to the trip to British Columbia, while doing research on the deep valleys around the endless maze of mountains surrounding Bella Coola, I learned of a remote glacial lake with a curious name, Ape Lake. The interesting thing about Ape Lake was there's a giant glacier that sort of keeps, I can't remember now if it's on the ocean side of the lake or on the other side, but basically there's a glacier that is at one end of the lake which controls the amount of water coming in or out. How it got its name was, I think it was in the 1940s or maybe the 1930s, some fellows were out there and they probably pack horsed in. They were looking out across the lake and it's a fairly large lake and they saw, they, at first they thought it was people walking around the edge of the lake. And I don't know if they had binoculars or whatever, but at some point they were able to get a better view and the, they realized that it wasn't people walking on two legs on the other side of the lake. And my guess is they probably thought they looked ape-like and that's where the name came from, so. Venturing to Ape Lake would have been something I would have loved to do, but with limited time and winter conditions still persisting at these higher elevations, it was simply not feasible. The hike just to get to Ape Lake on foot would have taken multiple days and is over eight miles one way, with much of it being unmarked and thus very serious wilderness mountaineering. That night, we camped off of the side of a logging road in the high country. Toast on there. Yeah, the original hamburger had uh, pieces of toast instead of like a bun. So we're keeping it authentic. <laughs> Just finished up dinner. We're just hanging out at camp now. It is a very high up spot, elevation wise. I don't know exactly what we're at, but we're pretty high up. Um, we've got the river down below, a lot of logging areas around here, a ridge above us. Spotted that black bear, a couple ridges up. Pretty chilly morning up here, higher elevation. The old logging equipment. So I'm just sitting here in camp, just kind of thinking, have some thoughts about just this area, how, how tough it is to get to just with a vehicle into this Bella Coola Valley area. And now we're up many miles, many kilometers, I think about 17 or so kilometers up 
up these old logging roads in an area where, you know, just stunning beauty, higher elevation than the valley itself, how remote it is. And this is just one road that cuts through here, but if you look just south of here, basically almost until the Squamish, British Columbia area, which is driving-wise 12 hours from here, there's, there's nothing. The way we have to drive from there is go into the interior of British Columbia and loop around because there's just these mountains. There's a ferry out of Bella Coola or you drive in through that road, which takes basically 10 to 12 hours, depending on how fast you do it. We did it over the course of two days. Knowing from here south to that point, there's just nothing. I mean, there's, there's so little. There are just endless amounts of these types of mountains and valleys and all the countless wildlife that live in there, it really kind of makes you feel that, uh, you know, how small as a human are, how small we are as people. And, you know, I've been to the vast expanses of wilderness in the lower 48 of the United States, whether it be in the Pacific Northwest, or it seems endless there, even parts of the Northeast or the Rocky Mountains in Colorado or Utah, where it just seems like it goes forever, and it does in a sense. There's a, a crazy amount of wilderness down there, but this just seems even more. There just seems to be more wilderness. I mean, I, I haven't had a feeling of this scale since Alaska. And I think a lot of these areas essentially are very comparable to coastal regions of Alaska in terms of remoteness and similar terrain and habitat and, and certainly wildlife, with the exception of uh, being mountain lions in this area as opposed to Alaska. So that possibility that something could be roaming around in this area, it's just, how would we even be able to find something like that? It'd be so difficult. We're so disadvantaged. So sort of thinking about it and the possibilities being there and how to approach this. As we've talked to so many of the locals, it seems many of the encounters happen closer to town while they're out hunting or camping or doing something in the local areas, usually the valley going further up from town or even in and around town. So these things seem to come down, whereas when you're in an area this wild, it just doesn't seem as possible to uh, cover much significant ground. So this house was where Edward Norton stayed during the film The Incredible Hulk when he was hiding out in Bella Coola. Here's a cool little local fact for you. As we departed the Bella Coola Valley and these beautiful New Hulk traditional lands, I reflected upon the grandeur found here and how it had imprinted on me. A place off the beaten path and somewhere where stories of old seem as real today as they were centuries ago. I am grateful to have shared a few stories from this place myself. I am very thankful to have spent time with various members of the New Hulk Nation who shared with us not only their stories, but their culture and places sacred to them. With that said, I will leave you with this wisdom from Jarrell that resonated deeply with me. It's the bedrock of each story because I can't tell the story of a Sninik without telling why the Sninik came to steal the children in the first place or why they're here. You know, this isn't my land or your land or anyone else's land. This is creator's land. This is something that was made <clears throat> for our people to be stewards, to not be rulers, right? We are to take care of it for the next generation. And all of that is embedded in the stories and woven through the language and the culture and even like uh, the word for parent amatala it means rope because they are a rope they are anchor that holds us to the next generation and to this world they're what ties us to things i would be nowhere without my mother and my father <laughs>